did we finally get a good Rings of Power episode? Not quite, but it was better. The episode starts off, we fly over Kazakh Doom and we have a weird transition where the mountain transitions into one of Durin's rings. His ring, the candy ring. So all of the dwarven rings have been made. We didn't even have a full episode of them creating them. Durin just rocked up in the last episode and bang, they're done. And we still got to make nine of these before the end of the show. And the Battle of Eregion is happening in the next episode or two. So we don't know how much time has actually passed when the rings have been made. Which this show has a really bad idea for the concept of time. You don't know, has this been months? Has this been weeks? We don't know. And are we going to know? No, they're not going to say that. Another question is, they stopped mining the Mithril in season one it was the whole point why Durin got angry and the deal with Alrond was off because they couldn't get the Mithril they had to dig deeper and King Durin wasn't going to do that and so with what Mithril they had left they made the three Alvin rings however they didn't have any Mithril left to make the dwarven rings so how the hell did they get the Mithril did they all of a sudden go back and little Durin just dug some more for Mithril we don't know, we don't get any more lines. We have to assume that they dug for more Mithril and then handed it over and then they created the rings from there, but we don't get any dialogue about this. We just go, yeah, they've created the rings and that's it. And how long would it take them to dig for Mithril? We don't know. So we see King Durin, the ring is talking to him. So the king is having voices in his head. The dwarfs at this point, they're trying to find light. They're trying to dig to get to the light. And King Durin just wanders his hand around on the rock. He goes wandering. He finds a spot and he's like, we're going to dig there. Little Durin and Narvi are like, no, don't do that. That's a bad idea. But King Durin... Durin's like, I'm not having any of this. I'm just going to do it. So they start arguing even more. King Durin and Little Durin. We have a really awkward shot where King Durin grabs the pickaxe and he just starts whacking on the wall and it lingers on the same shot. As Narvi and Durin are shouting at him, King Durin breaks through the wall and then we see light. And so King Durin goes around pointing at other spots on the walls to dig. I really like how they do the relationship between King Durin and Durin. You know, they established this in season one that it's quite frail and they do argue and I think that's really good. I think both of the actors do a fantastic job. And so when the scene plays through, you're actually invested. So they have their light system back. It's all back and running just in time before the crops died out. I mean, we don't know how much time has passed, actually. And they can exit Kazakh Doom, so they're playing it off as if they're all going to die, but they could literally just go up above ground. So the light is back, and King Durin is giving a speech. It's a pretty cool speech, to be honest with you. It is delivered really well by the actor, and all is going well. Morale is high. But then we get a shot of Deesa, and she's not happy. My first thought when I saw this was, why is she not happy? She was on board, literally, in the last episode with Anatar and Calabrimbo. She wanted the rings, and now all of a sudden, they've backtracked. Deesa's against it. Why? What's given her reason? So, Deesa's cutting some leaves from the underground tree. Do you remember that tree? The tree that the Mithril healed? Well, Deesa doesn't like the fact that King Durin is using the ring to cheat, that he can see all the pathways that she could hear with her singing, and so she's a bit jealous. He took her job. That's the reason why she's upset, not because the rings could be corrupted. She was on board with it last episode, but okay, she's upset now. And so we cut to them in a marketplace. I do like these sceneries. It's a nice side that we get to see. It's more world building. And we see that King Durin has put a tax on the dwarves. He's put a ring tax 
on all of the products that are being sold there. Dissa and Durin are buying their child a present for their birthday and she's pissed when they find out that there's a tax. She's not happy. It's more corruption. It's more of King Durin being greedy. He's acted fairly quickly, to be honest. Sauron fucking didn't mess around when he came to corrupting them. They're already corrupt. And so she bargains with the guy and she buys this stone. It is a very pretty stone. But we have a really, I mean, really, really, really funny scene. Oh. DC drops the gift and it rolls and rolls and rolls through a crowd no one stops it she's literally over the gift and she doesn't pick it up she lets it roll and it just keeps rolling all the way down to the mountain near the bottom of it through the caves through the tunnels it lands literally on the edge of a rock which stops it from falling into this big pool i don't know how and so she wanders down she then goes and sings lo and behold she finds the gift now this gift i don't know why she needed to sing for it it's literally right next to her she could literally look right down and it's there just open your eyes Disa. it's in front of you so she's happy now she's dancing and then we hear a rumbling in the deep oh god it appears that Disa's singing has awakened a balrog if this is going to be the reason why the balrog awakens because Disa just sings because she comically drops this ball just think she wouldn't have found out that there's a balrog down there or a mischievous being down there if this comical ball dropping scene didn't happen just think of that how significant will that scene be probably very significant but it is a very poor scene she then startled by the rumbling drops the stone and it breaks i just love the fact that the stone fell all the way through the mountain not breaking not cracking but then Disa just drops it and then boom it's shattered and you could have had Disa be in this same position any other way and you chose a comical way for this to happen what awful writing we cut to King during's quarters now he's invited the emissaries of the other dwarven kingdoms he's invited seven and he tells them about the new rings and they can have a share in them but it is going to come at a cost i don't get why sauron wouldn't have just gone to the other kingdoms and offered them the rings there instead of just giving them to king durin but king durin is gonna sell them at a price he wants half of their mining materials one way to alienate yourself king durin but one way to make a profit and so they are all sent away king durin is then back in his own place and he's looking around maps he wants to dig deeper for mithril and as he's chatting he notices his ring is missing and you see the dread in his face it is really well acted you can see that he is genuinely pissed he's scared he's panicked it's happened very quickly though the ring has really taken a hold but again we don't know how much time has passed so this could be a week after receiving the ring it could be a month we don't know and we see more of narvi i do like narvi he's having a go at narvi he suspects him but then he finds the ring and all is forgiven little durin breaks through the room and says that disa has discovered something dark beneath the mountain she has found a balrog i still can't believe this is the way that it happened but king durin just ignores it he says she's lying and then we move on durin goes to a region to talk to Calabrimbor, and when he comes back he's trying to convince his father that the rings are evil again but he just fobs it off he doesn't care and he says he's a very proud dad and Disa is pissed 
She makes him swear not to wear any of the rings and he swears it. But this will probably come up later and he will probably end up wearing a ring. In Numenor, Arpharason and Kermit are talking about the White Tower of Eresi, the gateway to the Undying Lands. What the fuck are they wearing? Look at Kermit's shoes. Jesus Christ. So, Arpharason is jealous of the elves, of their immortality, and he wants to achieve this. I think that this is a good scene for him. He's setting up his motivations in a normal way. He's talking to his son. So now Arpharason apparently is king straight away. No ceremony. We just cut from the last scene in the last episode and it is all done. And he talks to Kermit saying that his mum said that something bad will happen to him and he has a task for him to undo everything. This scene was good, although Kermit is absolutely shite. The actor is awful. So on the streets, the crowd are chanting for Arpharazon and we are with Elendil and Muriel, who for some reason, Muriel can only look upwards. I don't know why. She isn't happy because everyone is against her but Elendil assures her that she has allies in the sea is always right people and that they will fight for her she says no don't fight Elendil says that Muriel is the one that brought him to the faithful have we seen any of this on screen no we haven't their relationship is made up in this season rushed They're best friends, apparently. Muriel is the person who Elendil will be learning how to lead from, according to the showrunners. Fuck me, he's got a lot to learn. Elendil then talks about the vision he saw in the Palantir and how his vision revealed that he was at a new location. Muriel is shocked by this because the vision wasn't the fall of Numenor. And so she concludes, that the future of her people lies in Elendil. So then we cut to on the ground again. All of the men who were loyal to Queen Muriel have been stripped of their rank, including Isildur's mate. Jeez, this was quick. No trying to win them over, just straight away banished. I mean, he wasn't qualified for the job anyway. And all of this is because of Isildur's sister, who I still don't know what her name is. She's gone full evil and nobody cares. And who's on her shoulder? Kermit, the weaker one. She's going to be the strong leader of these people. And Kermit's going to be the weak one. She pulls Elendil aside. She says that Lord Balzagar wanted to charge Elendil deal with treason but she stopped it good on her and she's had a promotion elendil is not happy he says a quote her future is made of sea water take care to keep your feet beneath you it's a long way to the bottom why the fuck would he say that this is his daughter get her in line but no they need tension between the families and so They have made this right up. And so Elendil goes and resigns and all of the crew start to salute him as he's leaving. Later on, the faithful are holding a morning service and the high priest nicks the line from the Lord of the Rings about the far green country. Great. They've got to get one at least in every episode. Their ceremony is then disrupted by Kermit, who disperses them. As they are leaving, an old man says that he wants one of the old relics. And so Kermit smashes it. And my favourite scene of the whole episode, Elendil then punches him. Thank the gods. As he's about to hit Elendil, Isildur's mate stops it and they have one of the worst fights I have ever seen. It was so shaky, so bad, it felt like it was shot on a vibrator. And so Isildur's mate wins the fight. He has a sword to Kermit's neck, but then Elendil tells him to stop. He does stop, and lo and behold, as he's dropped the sword, his back 
is turned and Kermit goes and kills Isildur's mate. In Eregion, we are with Yaddle, I mean Calabrimbor, and he's giving a speech. So Calabrimbor goes on a big speech. He's thanking the dwarfs for working together and he's thanking Sauron for helping make all of this happen. And Sauron, instead of looking happy, he's just looking depressed. Like, why? You're trying to fit in here. You're sticking out like a sore thumb. You even have a comical moment where Murdania, I think her name is, or fuck knows whatever her name is, puts her hand on him to tap him to say, it's okay, mate, he's fuming. Narvi and a few of the dwarves are in attendance and they reveal the doors of of Durin. We see in the last episode that Calabrimbor was working on the door and that the door is made of Mithril. This is a nice callback because in the history, Narvi and Calabrimbor do work on the door and do help to make it. So I thought that this was a nice call. But as Narvi and Calabrimbor are talking, Sauron just wanders off. He fucks off. So he's sulking by a windowsill and his bro, Calabrimbor, goes to join him. There's tension between the two. Sauron says that Calabrimbor doesn't listen to him and that they should create the rings for men. But Calabrimbor is very sceptical at this point. He doesn't want to make the rings of men for some reason. He says that they will corrupt easily. Sauron is still trying to convince him. Calabrimbor's not having none of it. Sauron then talks talks about Numenor and how Numenor is currently weak. There are fractions there. This is obviously hinting at something later on. Calabrimbor still doubles down that he's not having it. No rings are to be made for men. But Sauron says the rings are going to be made for the most wise, the most noble and purest of heart from Numenor to Rune. So are the rings going to be made for kings of men? It doesn't look like it. It's going to be anyone who he deems to be fit for it. And that this time, being third time lucky, is going to be the masterpiece, bringing all of the rings together. Calabrimbor says, no, we're not doing it. And Sauron says, fine, I'll go and do it myself. In Calabrimbor's chambers, he has written to Gilgalad. He's just blatantly lying at this point. I mean, Gilgalad already has spies available, so why are there no spies within Eregion? Surely someone would have reported this back to Gilgalad. But no, he's just lying. We see a shot of Gilgalad and he's not happy. With Gilgalad, we have the commander of the south. Ooh. And she informs him that the Amada is ready to set sail and attack Mordor. For some reason, Gilgalad is just delaying this. I don't know why he's delaying this, but this line made me laugh. The commander says that Galadriel was wrong because Eregion seems fine and they should let their armies depart. Wait, how do you know that everything is okay in Eregion? You already suspect that Calabrimbor is being influenced by Sauron, so surely you wouldn't take this as your word. Also, they want to depart for Mordor. They have already established that they have spies. So why have they not seen Adar's army on the move? And they are still going for Mordor. Why? You have spies in that region. Surely they would have told you that they aren't there. Absolutely awful. Gilgalad decides then to have a stock clip PTSD vision and we see a fish, Sauron and an orc eating. He snaps out of it and continues to say nothing. She then says again that the enemies are in Mordor, which they aren't. If they would have used their spies, they would have known that they aren't in Mordor. And then she says that Gilgalad is relying on the whispers of the ring. How would she know this? Has Gilgalad mentioned that the ring talks to him? Or can she hear it? We don't know. She just says it literally. She knows about it. Are they going to explain it? No. Then we cut to Aurond doing the best Monty Python run ever. He chucks his cloak on the floor to run. 
faster, and then we cut away. All is not going well in Eregion, as Sauron and Murdania, whatever her name is, have been working on a ring. Objects are flying around the room, it looks like a paranormal activity film, but we see Calabrimbor hold one of the objects, and then takes the ring off, and we see Murdania has been using a ring which turns her invisible. Hmm, I wonder which ring this will be. Now, this ring sent her into a misty, fiery world and she sees Sauron and she says that he's been here all this time and no one suspects Anatar. They literally just carry on. Please don't say that this is the prototype for the one ring. We see Calabrimbor hand the ring to Anatar. So I'm going to pledge my bets that this will be the one ring. And if it is, just think that Murdania is the first person to use the one ring. Oh fuck. So Sauron's trying to explain that they've tried to create this ring, but it hasn't worked. They've used too much Mithril. But as they are talking, they are interrupted as a god walks in and says that Durin is outside and he wants to talk about the rings. There's no privacy, he just tells them the message in front of everybody. Durin reports to Calabrimbor that King Durin has changed and says that the rings have caused this. But Calabrimbor says the rings are faultless. I think the show is trying to imply that Sauron needed to touch the rings to work on them to make them evil and corrupted. And that's why the Alvin rings aren't evil. However, in season one, Halbrand does work on the Alvin rings. So how do you explain that? So we cut to Sauron and Murdania. They are chatting about what she has seen. She's been to the other side. And Sauron says that he has seen that side too. And that Calabrimbor is weak. They do this weird thing where one minute she's talking in Cinderin, next minute they're back in English. Why do they keep changing? It just took me out of the scene. And then as they are talking, Sauron mentions that she reminds him of Galadriel and he sort of flirts with her. Are they still trying to ship this? Did Sauron actually get a boner for Galadriel? What the actual fuck? Calabrimbor and Sauron are arguing again. What a bromance. Calabrimbor states that the dwarven rings don't work and asks if Sauron changed anything to do with the rings. And he says... No, we did. He's manipulating it as if it's Calabrimbor's fault. I don't get why he didn't just stick with his first answer of no. Calabrimbor wasn't going to question this. He looked like the conversation was done. But then he's doing it to manipulate him. And we find out why. So Sauron has found out that Calabrimbor has been a naughty boy and has been sending letters to Gilgalad saying that every Everything is fine. The forge is all done. No more work has been done. And so Sauron gives Calabrimbor two choices to tell Gilgadaddy the truth or carry on and make more rings. I don't know why Calabrimbor just settles with these two choices. He could literally just stop making any more rings. I don't get why by making more rings it would make up for not telling Gilgalad. I don't get their logic but somehow it works and he picks the option of making more rings. Calabrimbor is making another speech He's giving a pep talk to all of the crew. He said that their work on the Dwarven Rings failed and he has a go at Myrdania saying that they didn't work hard enough. Their work was somehow corrupted but now they are going to make the Nine Rings for Men. He wants to make the Rings of Men because free brings balance and that the nine rings of men are going to redeem the seven rings of the dwarven lords that doesn't happen anywhere within the law 
I don't get why you would not just recall the dwarven rings and reshape them. You can work with the alloy, you can melt them down. Why wouldn't you just recall them? Why then make more rings, which you could potentially fuck up even more? Because you think your logic is that, oh, okay, we will make more to make these previously shit rings better. What? Calabrimbor then goes off in a rant and goes for some quiet time. He's shaking like a shitting dog and the camera pulls out of the window. We see that Adar is right next to Eregion. Fuck, the spies can't even spot him from there. How much time has passed? How long does it take to go from Eregion to Mordor? And so we are with Alrond. He's ran all the way back home with the Power Rangers and they warn Gilgalad. He says that Gladwell's plan was right and that they should send the army to Eregion. Let's face it, they should have done that anyway. Gladwell's plan wasn't right. She wanted to send the army up the Anduin to attack Mordor from the west. So how was her plan correct? But again, for some reason, Gilgalad doesn't want to send any of his army he's like no we aren't going alone why would he just abandon the kingdom of Eregion? that is massive you have allies there why would you let a sauron or b adar have it it just does not make sense but i guess this gilglad is just a coward so then we cut to the orcs they are just out in daylight without a care in the world. Galadriel is in a cage. Thank fuck. She is let out. An orc goes to kill her. But then Adar steps in. Stops the orc. And then Galadriel pulls a knife on Adar. Doesn't kill him straight away. She could probably kill all of those orcs by the way. And she has him in a neck hold, which is probably the weakest neck hold ever. He could easily get out of it. But Adar gives her an offer. He wants her as an ally rather than a foe. And that is how episode 5 ends. So guys and girls, there you have it. This episode was probably the best episode of the whole show it wasn't good but it wasn't as bad as the others there wasn't many scenes that really pissed me off so guys and girls let me know what you think of the episode thank you so much for watching please like subscribe comment share and peace